Today's class will be a somewhat shorter than normal, but uh, we have this theory, the theory based on Linda Hill, then we have one left, which is Kirk Hansen, and then we'll have covered all the ethical theories, which we are now practicing to apply to actual cases. So, we have, fo we're focusing on actual leaders in two situations, in two countries in which we have actual business and political leaders. The first case was Italy. The name of the company, the corporation? Any. <coughs> okay, what are the two uh, experiences or what are the two uh, contexts which Linda Hill assumes will help you stay out of the flow of success. For those of you who are having a tough time, like you have to work nights and blah, 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 and you have other issues at home, you don't have the luxury of suffering under the flow of success. Why does Linda Hill consider the flow of success to be a dangerous situation? Why does she consider it to be something that will weaken your skills in your career, especially if you have leadership responsibilities. Can someone give me, what's the problem with the flow of success? Okay, if you're in the flow of success, you haven't experienced dealing with problems. From an ethical perspective, that's, that's, that's an issue for everyone. But from an ethical perspective, why is the assumption that everything's gonna go your way uh, precarious? Why is it a dangerous place to be? Right, you assume that every, every time you try something, it's going to work, and when it doesn't work, you're tempted to break the rules. Not to break the rules for post-conventional reasons, but to break the rules because you are unable to succeed without cheating, without committing a crime, or at least acting unethically. So the difficulty is that your expectations are that everything you try will work your way because you have a good education, you have experience, you have contacts, you have networks, and things are working for you. By the way, just, just to clear this up, uh, because some of you are, uh, some, of, some of you asked me this question, what is the difference between networking or contacts and what's called in Arabic, wasta. Wasta is unethical. Contacts, using contacts or networking is normal. What's the difference? Contact, yes. They, they will study yeah, they will the individual. If you know wasta, yeah. without yeah. studying, they will, uh, that's normal. Okay. You know what to do. You know you, the, to when you have contacts to people, where do they come from? from your own merit. Networking and contacts are largely merit-based. Of course, some of your contacts, some of your networks will come from family or friends. Uh, but as a rule, one of the things that people do around the world, starting in high school, is to work on your network. And often when you move from one, like when I moved from Austria to Lebanon, I left my network back in Austria. Not much of it is, not, is of any use here. So I took 15 years to rebuild my network. And for example, when we went to Muzadek, uh, the price of the tickets went up by, 50, by 100%. We went from 250, almost 100%, from 250 to $450 because the charter flights were no longer available because charter flights are not attractive because people don't want to go on vacation on the coast, Turkish coast, right beside Syria, for some unexplainable reason. So the, the, the vacationers are not going to the coast around Hatay, around Antioch and Adana. These areas are no longer seen as recreational, if you will. So we had to take a normal flight. And so when I had to come up with $4,000 in one week through donations, 
I used my networks and contacts. Very, totally ethical thing. You call, we also say calling in favors. I do something for you, I do something for you, I do something for you, now can you help me? And people are glad to do that. Wasta, on the other hand, is in English, influence peddling. Influence is clear. What's peddling? Does anyone know? What, what, no. Yeah, it's the same word. But a peddler. It comes from the word ped, which means foot. It's somebody who sells things door to door. Lebanese immigrants were well known for doing that when they arrived in Australia or Canada or Brazil. The first thing they did was go out into the frontier where there were no stores and sold things. Clothing, sewing materials, spices, and this kind of thing. People need, things people needed on a daily basis which are not available. Peddling. So when you peddle, you understand peddling now. When you peddle influence, which means Basically, you have sort of a drawer here. Instead of watches, you have influence. And so you go to people who have connections, and they set things up for you. Influence peddling is the English word for wasta. Apparently, that exists in the English-speaking world, too. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's called, in German, by the way, it's called vitamin B. Vitamin B, the word for connections, is beziehung just in case you're interested. Beziehung. It's that time again. OK, so Beziehung, vitamin B, influence peddling, WASTA, they're all relatively unethical practices. Contacts are not. So Italy is also well known for a huge WASTA system. What do we know about the any corporation? What was the issue there? Why was it so corrupt? It was state owned. It w and state owned as was most heavy industry in Italy owned by the government. What came on top of that? No. Right, because the Christian Democratic Party was in power for 40 years. Any party, whether it's Christian Democrat or socialist or liberal, whatever, any party that's in power for that long will become corrupt. We have the saying, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So what was the challenge for Franco Bonabe when he came to, came to any as a CEO, he was confronted with a company that was in transition. What was happening? It was transitioning from what to what? From government owned to private. One of the, this is one of the issues, by the way, we had in the very, very first chapter, second chapter actually, uh, on ethics and public management. We had the issue of privatization. Privatization is considered important internationally because it encourages what? What do government businesses often not do? E EDL, Electricité de Le Bon. What does, it, what does it not have to do? Compete. Compete. Anybody who's a business student, but anybody who's not a business student should be interested in this as well. Normally, competition keeps us clean and keeps us working. Without competition, you have high prices and low quality. Now, do football players, excuse me back there, do football players like competition? No. no, they don't. They don't? They, have it, but they, they, don't, they like don't like it. Imagine in the World Cup, you could just go down to Rio and win. Just say, oh, I'm here, I won. Would you prefer that? No, no. It's not 
It's you prefer it. You could. You wouldn't have to. You wouldn't even have to train. So, if we are interested in systemic values. Who in if, if, if football players, as a rule, prefer not to compete, how about their coaches? Do they want to compete? No. Not really. It's easier. That's why there's a lot of problems with game fixing. So if the players don't want to compete and the coaches don't want to compete, how about the owners? Do they want to compete? Or would they just prefer to win and get all the, the glory? So wh what we're talking about here is a dispositional tendency not to like competition. Is everybody clear about that? Most of us, if, we, if given a choice, hey, uh, don't bother studying, I'll just give you an A. Everyone would take it, right? But in the end, you'd learn nothing. Your parents would spend, spend a lot of money on tuition, you, you, would earn, you would learn nothing, and you wouldn't get a job afterwards. So. If I'm on the dispositional level, remember dispositional, situational, systemic, on the dispositional le level, all, the, all of the participants, whether they're, they're, they're football players, the coaches, or the owners, if they're not interested in competition, who, who's, go who's going to enforce competition? Is competition good for the common good? So which instance is responsible for making sure that the rules are obeyed in international football? What is it again? FIFA. What does the A stand for? OK, if I put this on the test, will you be able, will you be able to answer? Would that be a good question? What does FIFA stand for? Yes. OK. Mundial? OK. If you will. FIFA is responsible for the systemic good. If we look at the business world or politics, who's responsible for ensuring that there's competition in the economy? Take, let's take the football an analogy. Do, do, the, do the workers in a, in a business, do they want to compete? No. no. Do the managers in the business want to compete? No. Do the owners in a business no. want to compete? No. no. This is why we have monopolies. This is why companies try to control an entire industry. We have this in Lebanon. You control an entire sector, then nobody can force you to do anything. You can keep the prices up and the quality down. I've noticed a lot of products that I like, I can't get in Lebanon. Sometimes I feel like I'm in East, communist East Germany. I go to the store and there's all kinds of products. They're being offered for a while, then they just disappear in the entire country. Now how's that work? Because there, there's no competition. If there were competition and there's a demand for something, they'd sell it, but in certain sectors, there's no competition, so maybe the quality is the same, but the variety, the selection is, su is suffering. So who's responsible? Who's the FIFA? And can you close the door? Windows back there. It's pretty loud out there. Who's the FIFA? Or can you close that too? Yeah, the air conditioning's on. Who is the FIFA from an economic perspective? Who's responsible? If we know in football, players, man managers, owners don't want to compete. FIFA enforces competition. OK. Who's the FIFA in business, in the business sector? OK, good. The WTO, the World Trade Organization, another one. OK, we can, we can put that on the, on the test. World Trade Organization, thank you for saying that. What is the World Trade Organization's goal? To increase, to introduce regulation? 
to de decrease it. The whole purpose of the WTO is to eliminate all forms of regulation as much as possible. So, who's responsible for enforcing competition? If market forces lead, let me give you an example. Ten years ago, some of you might have seen the movie Jobs. Ten years ago, let's say 15 years ago, there was one computer software company, and that was it. Microsoft, big blue, right? And their, and, their, and their prices were pretty high, and their quality was pretty bad. It still is pretty bad. No, no. no it's getting better? It's yeah. getting better? I'm sorry. OK, I'm sorry. OK, good. <laughs> someone's got, an, I, someone's got a, a laptop, a, a PC. OK, good. So which companies have profited from the, the anti-monopoly, not deregulation, the anti-monopoly policies with respect to Microsoft? Apple and? Google. Google. Today, Google and Apple control the market. Our prices have gone down. Quality has gone up. So when you have a search, when you want to go online, you can either do Firefox or Google, or you can use your old weird IBM uh, products. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, Internet Explorer. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> uh, we, we all have Internet Explorer on, on our computer just in case, right? We might, we might, you know, sometimes you might need it, right? You never know. Sometimes the university blocks Google for some reason, right? And then we can go to Internet Explorer because the university doesn't block Internet Explorer for some reason. Uh, okay, so who's responsible? Who is responsible for deregulate, for, for breaking up? Microsoft's monopoly? The EU, anti-monopoly authorities, and the US, anti-monopoly authorities. Why is that enough? Why, why, why if the EU, they're the, those are the two big markets? No, that was 15, 10, 15 years ago. Today, we probably have to bring in the Chinese, right? Uh, so if this ever happens again, you'd have the EU authorities the US authorities and the Chinese authorities would have to join in. Otherwise, that wouldn't work. So NE is being privatized. The reason for this is because over the, over the long term, government-controlled corporations usually don't provide good services. There are exceptions. Which exceptions are there to this rule? That uh, healthcare. healthcare, for example. There are certain services where many would argue it's better to keep the government in charge. One of them would be health care. If, if, if the health care sector is primarily for profit, what's the problem with that? No, for profit health care services. What's, well, yes, you will. You can pay for it. What, what, who suffers immediately under a for-profit healthcare system? People with low incomes. Second, who suffers? That's a, those are usually people with low income. People who have chronic, people who are old. But normally if you're rich, that's not a problem either. Geographically, some areas are underserviced. There's not like, actually, interestingly enough, this region around NDU is underserviced. That's why we're building a hospital. Did you know that? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Bravo. OK. So they did a study of the market, and there's actually a need for a hospital here. When LAU built their hospital, they or took over a hospital. They didn't build a hospital because there was a Beirut is overserviced. Kisser Wayne, Metin is underserviced. So actually, it's a good thing. So, the, the reasons that privatization could be detrimental, could be a bad thing, is one, so people with low income are not provided with healthcare services, and certain regions are not as profitable. Let's take water, same thing. It's cheaper to provide water in densely populated areas. If you increase the price of water, some people will be cut off. How about electricity? Same thing. How about education? Same thing. How about transportation? 
same thing. Some of you might have, look, ha, some of you might have had a look at, at the Society of Civil Engineers slash FLIPS train exhibit. You see it? Isn't it great? Yeah. It's now going to schools. The first school it's going to go to is Notre Dame Jamhur. And then it's going to go to the Beirut Garden Show. And then after that, it's going to Rayak and to several schools in the Bekaa. Oh, yeah. so, so if you know anybody who wants a school exhibit, wants to use this for their school, please tell me it's for free. The only problem is each time we put it up and take it down, it starts getting more and more damaged. So we might have to do a whole new set pretty soon. OK, anyway, so the logic of privatization. So Banabe is confronted with what? What, what is the product? Give me, give me an example of what happens to a company when it is government owned for a long time. Corruption. Corruption. How does that play itself out? What are, the, what are the examples of that? What are the symptoms? What is corrupt? OK, we, monopolies, high prices, low quality. But within the company, within the organization, what are some of the symptoms or effects of long-term government ownership? What? OK. Lack of discipline in the workforce. OK. Can, can you raise your hands and answer one by one? Yes. Well, that would be a problem in, private, in the private sector as well. What's specifically a problem for government companies where there's no competition. Hiring. How do you get a job in the EDL? WASTA. Imagine that an entire sector hires its employees based on WASTA. What does that mean? It means that the people are not hired because of their skills. I mean, I, I recently uh, was, I told you about this, had to go to the finance ministry for, to pay back taxes from 2008. It was over $1,000, but I thought the money was well invested. I saw that the finan in finance ministry is actually a very well-functioning institution. The uh, first time I went there, I went with my, my brother-in-law. Uh, it was friendly, clean, efficient, well-lit. It was a what? Yeah, it was the finance ministry down in down. Second time I went there, I went alone, and I discovered that they also speak English. <laughs> and, I, and I was asking, how is that possible? Why is this ministry so different? And everyone said, it's because they want our money. But someone told me that actually the hiring practices there are relatively transparent. People are hired in the finance ministry as opposed to other ministries based on, largely on their qualifications. And you can see it. So. Hiring based on qualifications versus hiring not based on qualifications. So Barnabe was, was confronted with a company with a lot of corrupt and incompetent employees. What about the labor union in such a situation? What is it, what, the labor union, is it, is it actually there to defend the workers' rights against the employers when everybody's getting a job through WASTA? Or is the labor union more like a mafia organization distributing access to resources and jobs? Second option. The, 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 the last problem is that the function of the social partners, of workers versus employers, whether or not it's conflictual or, 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 or harmonious, the labor unions stop being true labor unions. They s look at the, the syndicate or the professional organization of professors at the Lebanese University. It's not a real labor union because it's basically just administering the privileges that people have at that university. By the way, we are now getting a labor union in our, our sector. The private universities now teach more than half of the students. So the syndicate of private university professors was set up in March 
2013. They're now organizing, they've set up, they've set up or, uh, I know that they've set up something in AUB, and I am helping the professors at Haigazian University to set up a real labor union. So, labor unions tend to be corrupt institutions as well. So, we talked about this before when we talked about the different ways that employers, businesses do good in society. Can someone run through that again? When a, when, in, when a company wants to help out its environment, help, help out the community it's located in, what are the, remember those, that list of six? Number one, uh, I, didn't, I didn't put that on the test, did I? Yes. I did it, I did, it was on the test? No, it wasn't on the test. Let's put it on the second test. Now that we're talking about it, we can put it on the second test. Okay, one, charity. Throughout history, People with resources and power have been charitable. They've helped people who are less well off. This is something that you find privately, you find this in religious institutions, you find it generally throughout society, and since human history we find this behavior. Charity. Number two. Someone's looking in their notes. That's way bottom, at the bottom of the list. Number two. That's at the bottom of the list. That is about number three. Number two, paternal, paternalistic entrepreneurship, paternalism. I gave you an example of a company, Swarovski, an Austrian glass company that basically took care of the workers and the community around them by, for the workers, workers didn't have good schools, the employer gave them good schools. Workers don't have good health care, the employer gives them good health care. The workers don't have access to education, we already had that. The workers don't have good housing, access to sports, culture, the employer takes care of that. What do you achieve by doing that? Two things. Incredible loyalty, and more important, when you have qualified workers, what are you worried about? Lo losing them. It's called retention. Retention. So you have high levels of loyalty and retention, number one. Number two, no unions. No need for them. Okay, number three, philanthropy. P. Number four, what, what, is, what is philanthropy? Love of human beings, thank you. Some, someone knows Greek, okay. Uh, what is philanthropy? Give me an example. How about the bank, the Lebanese, the Lebanese National Bank funding the marathon? That's philanthropy. That's philanthropy. Wait a second, we'll talk about CSR. Okay, philanthropy. Next one. Sponsorship. Then? CSR. And now what's the difference between philanthropy and CSR? They look the same. Sponsorship is when you have an event and then somebody puts their their core area of activity. Core, guys, you should know this. If you're in engineering, I assume you're gonna work for an some sort of institutional organization. Are you gonna be an, a lone engineer out on your own? No, you're gonna be working for an institution. All institutions have this possibility of corporate social responsibility. Also universities can have CSR. It's in your core area of activity. So. We're trying to talk Total, which has a gas station here, into working for the train train NGO. Why is that CSR? It's their field. It's their field. Why? Fuel. fuel. And normally their fuel is used for cars and trucks and buses. So they have an interest in encouraging a responsible and sustainable mix of transportation options. So CSR. 
Next. Social partnership. That's why I brought this up. Social partnership. This will, be this will be important for both the Italian and the South African examples. What is social partnership? It's not well known in the Middle East because normally you understand things that you're familiar with that you've been confronted with. Social partnership is an alliance between the government business and the unions often called in Lebanese English syndicates just again parentheses for clarification when you're when you're doing your paper or when you're doing your tests what is the difference between a syndicate and a union it's used interchangeably. Syndicates basically mean associations. What is a labor union? So you don't know, okay. Uh, recently we had strikes in the educational sector. Big ones last year. This year it wasn't quite as big. Who was organizing the strikes? The labor unions. And who are members of labor unions? Yeah. Workers, people who have jobs. People who don't own the means of production. OK, write it down. Hint. What's the means of production? What, are, what, is the, what does means mean? Means ways. mean. Ways. ways, methods of production. Way, methods, ways of creating things. More specifically, the means of production are the things you use to make profit. So what are the means of production? Name, some, name one cat categories. What do you use to make profit? The first thing you have to have before... Machines. 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 Some basic machines. Then you need something to put into the machine. Raw materials. So which one comes first? It depends. So raw materials and machines are two means of production. But normally, when you want to produce things, you have to buy them first. So the third means of production is capital. So technology, raw, raw materials, capital are the means of production. People aren't the means of production, sorry, <laughs> unless they're slaves, which is illegal. Uh, people don't sell themselves. People sell their time. Time. This is important. You're, you're not even, a, there are, by the way, parentheses again. There are two human rights which are non-negotiable, which under no circumstances can be violated. There's, do you have an absolute right to life? Yes. No. If you shoot somebody, if, you, if I walk into the Bibliotheque Bank with a gun and say, stick them up, oh. can, they, can they stop me? Yes. Self-defense. There's no absolute right to life. How about absolute right to freedom of expression? Can I say whatever I want? No. How about absolute right to freedom of movement? How about I come into your house and say, I want to take over this house. It's a nice house. My house isn't as nice. I'll move in here. There, there are many different human rights which are limited, where there are restrictions. There are two that are non-negotiable, where there's absolutely no circumstances in which you're allowed to do this. We had this before. One of them is related to the TV show 24. Remember? 24, who's the hero? Jack Bauer, right? OK, Jack Bauer always likes to do what with the people he catches? Torture, Torture them. Because there's a tip ticking bomb, one million people in Los Angeles are going to die unless Jack Bauer tortures the information out of them. We had this in, con in which context? Remember at the beginning of the semester? Two types of ethics? Deontological, de remember? 
versus utilitarian, remember? So, under, from a deontological perspective, you, we could argue there's no right to torture. From a utilitarian, we could argue that there is. There are two human rights. The second one is slavery. So, this is, why, why am I bringing this up? Because workers are not a means of production, unless they're slaves. We sell our time. So the three means of production are raw materials, technology, and capital. So, social partnership unites this. Which, which regions in the world, does anybody know, uh, in which regions in the world do they still have strong labor unions? Not all of Europe. China. Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, France, Scandinavia. They've, they've been weakened in England. Uh, then, which Arab countries have strong labor unions? Egypt. Tunisia, Egypt, and interestingly enough, Kuwait. Old oil, not, <laughs> you know, old money versus new money. There's also old oil versus new oil. Kuwait is a very, relatively speaking, old oil producing country and it has strong labor unions. Okay, so Lebanon used to have strong labor unions before the Civil War. So social partnership is the next to last one and the last one is, we've been through this before, social entrepreneurship. I just had a discussion when I was in Muzadek about this issue. There's something called Zukal Tayeb. Has anybody heard of it? Zukal Tayeb, a farmer's market? No? Bala? You heard about it? You heard about it. Okay. It's an, it's an initiative which, has been, which was set up about 15, 20 years ago to help small farmers in peripheral areas, areas that are far away from Beirut, to produce traditional food and sell it at a profit. What is, th let's go over this one last time because it's important. What is the advantage of social entrepreneurship versus an NGO? What's the problem with NGOs, remember? Wait, 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 why don't you raise your hand? Yes. NGOs don't take money? NGOs take money. We, we all, wait, wait one second. Everybody knows what an NGO is. Does anybody need that explained? Non-governmental organizations. Okay, where do NGOs get their funding? One possibility is membership. Some NGOs, I work for an NGO, or work, I actually helped found it, called Relief and Reconciliation for Syria. We do schools for refugee f re refugees in the so-called, parentheses again, informal, tented settlements. In Lebanon, you're not allowed to say camps with respect to the, to the Syrian refugees. There's over a million Syrian refugees, but none of them live in camps. Because camps reminds us of what? Palestinians. Palestinians. So there are plenty of camps, but we don't call them camps. We call them ITSs. And in the ITSs, there are no schools. All the refugee kids are supposed to go to the Lebanese schools. But now there are 300,000 Lebanese school children and 340,000 Syrian school children. Now how's that supposed to work? It doesn't work, right? So we were, we're providing educational services in the, oops, shouldn't say camp, ITSs, right? And this, <laughs> if you're interested, little, little sales pitch for a NGO that lives off of membership dues. Relief and reconciliation for Syria. You can Google it. By the way, I'll be gone. No, I won't. I'll be, I'll be missing T, uh, MWF. Um, I'll, I won't be gone, sorry. Uh, the 23rd or the 26th, I'll be up in Berkesla again. Berkesla. If you're not Druze, it's Berkesla. Berkesla. You know it? You do? Yeah? Why? 
Oh, really? Okay, I, 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 I spend a lot of time up in Bar-Hesla. God, God knows where that is, right? Anyway, it's a, it's a very beautiful town. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Relief and reconciliation for Lebanon lives off of membership dues. We, we have membership organizations now in 12 countries, and they pay like 25, 30 euros or do dollars a week, a month, and that's how the organization can live. Very few organizations do that today. What are other ways for NGOs to have funds? They can have sponsorship. Sponsorship from companies or donors. Or they can get philanthropy. What's the problem when you take donations from large organizations? They'll, they'll, they'll control what you're doing. There's the saying in English, whoever pays the piper, this is an Irish you know, or Scottish thing, the piper, whoever, pays the, whoever plays the piper calls the tune. So I don't know if you've seen this, but it's common around the world. Musicians come into an event. They want to play, but they want you to pay them, right? And when you pay them, you get, you get to decide which song they're going to play, right? So NGOs who take funding have the tendency to sing the song that their donors would like them to sing. That reduces their autonomy. That makes them dependent on local, private, or political institutions, or international ones. So what is a good way of becoming independent? To have money, have your own funding. From where? Membership dues. What if, what if you don't have enough members? How about making a profit? So I, w I was, interestingly enough, discussing with somebody from the United Nations uh, on Saturday this very issue. He said, it's dirty what Sukkot Tayyab is doing. It's dirty. They're making money off of these poor women who are living in the, in the remote areas of Lebanon, trying to make a living. And this guy who runs Zuhul Tayyab is cashing in and making money off of that. That's not ethical. W when would that not be ethical? When he doesn't give them a fair price for their products, and when he takes most of the profits and pockets them. If he takes most of the profits and reintroduces them, reintegrates them into the organization, that's called sustainable. What does sustainable mean? Keep going under your own power. That's actually what automobile means, right? <laughs> you move, you're driven by your own self-generated resources. And so social entrepreneurship is now seen as a highly interesting model for sustainable doing good. These are private, these are for-profit organizations that work the same way that NGOs do. By the way, a lot of companies, a lot of groups have a mix. You can have an organization that is half NGO and half social entrepreneurship. Personally, I actually did that back in the 90s, and I, but we didn't know then that that was what it was called because the term social entrepreneurship didn't exist yet. Okay, let's get back to the labor unions. So, Barnabe is confronted now with any, a company that is making huge losses. Who's paying for the losses? Who pays for the losses of government-owned companies? The taxpayers, the people, the citizens. So, basically, they can never go out of business. Why can EDL never go out of business? We don't need it. No competition. Could, could Sakhle live without EDL? No. Yes. 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 Who knows Sakhle? Sakhle. Yes. They have their own electricity. Could they live without EDL? Yes. yes. Could other towns follow that model? Yes. Of course. We could live without EDL. But why can't they go out of business? The government, the government won't let them. They keep on pumping our money into the EDL. That was the situation with any. Italy's largest chemicals and petro, pet, pet, uh, petroleum company, so petrochemical company. So when he takes over the company, he's accused of, he tries to get rid of the corrupt practices, and what happens? They fight. Who fights him? The right. If he finds that there are people who are doing unethical or illegal things, what's his first response as an ethical leader? Fire them 
Or if it's criminal, no, you don't kill them. Okay, that's not, that's not the Italian way, right? That's a stereotype that they call in the, okay, have them arrested. So several hundred top level any employees were arrested and went to trial. So what happens next? We went through this already. They fight back. How? If he hasn't made any mistakes, they invent, they fabricate things. And now the last point, and then we'll, we'll start, we'll, we'll pick up again. What happens next? He's, he's charged with corruption himself. To the extent that the charges are so believable, so credible, that his own mother, right, someone remember that, his own mother, and we, now you can use the Italian stereotype, his own mama doesn't even believe anymore that he's an honest man. So how does he keep going? He has two things that Linda Hill calls for. If you want to escape the flow of success, two things. Two things. He grew up in which kind of context? Can, someone, can you raise your hand and speak so that we, I can hear you? Yes. Cross, this is important. Cross cultural cognitive Dissonance. It's in your book. Dissonance is the opposite of harmony. harmony. Cognitive means your learning processes. So your learning processes are, are not harmonious. They're very imbalanced. They're very troubling. You don't feel happy when you have cognitive dissonance. You're learning things that are contradicting each other. And the reason for this is because of the cultural situation you're in. And what's the example that, uh, what is the situation that Franco Bonabi is in? Which town does he come from? Stetzing. Stetzing or Vip, Vipiteno in Italian. All towns in this province are called South Tyrol, have two names, one German one Italian, Vipiteno Stetzing. He grows up in a situation where the Italians are what? They're settlers. The Italians are settlers. Who brought them there? Mussolini. They were brought in by the fascist government because they wanted to keep the Germans under control. If you, if you take over a new piece of land and you want to keep the population under control, you do the old Israeli trick. What did the Israelis do in the West Bank? They settled the Jewish population. What's the purpose of that? To keep, yeah, but also to keep the region under control. What did the English do when they took Ireland, when they conquered Ireland? Brought in Protestant settlers from Scotland. So whether it's 300 years ago, English settling Scottish Protestants in a Catholic Irish country, or Mussolini settling Italians in northern Italy, which is German-speaking, or the Israelis settling Jews in the West Bank and Gaza, now they left Gaza. It's the same thing. If you are growing up in the West Bank today as a Jew, do you feel happy? Not really, because it's very, it's very dangerous to live there. You're not welcome. And so this is the situation that Franco Bonabe grew up in. Now, the situation in northern Italy has been solved. How did they solve the problem? How would you solve a problem of ethnic conflict like this? Give people their rights. Today, the German-speaking minority in northern Italy has more rights than the Italians. They've basically been fully compensated for what happened to them under Mussolini. Second thing that he did, he was confronted with significant now, was that, was that significant adversity something that just happened to him, or did he go looking for it? It happened to him. No. 
He went looking for it. Guys, if you, if, you, if you feel that you're in the flow of success, you can throw yourself into a very negative situation and learn to swim. Jump in the deep water and learn to swim. What did he do? He went and worked for, for low-income elderly people and discovered the very, very ugly side of Italian society, how poor old people are treated very badly. Okay, good. So what's the, no, what's the, if you will, commonality between Barnabe's experience and whistleblowers? What's the, what's the similarity? When he's attacked, what's the first thing that the people do to, def to defend themselves. When, they're, when the employees who he's firing are sending to prison, counterattack. What's his weakness? His family. What's the first thing on the, the list of things you should do if you want to be a whistleblower? Family. Consult your friends and family and make sure they're going to stick with you down this road of adventure. Good. Okay. Now, well, the class is now over. 